In this video we'll be looking at materials and shaders and how we can apply these to your objects. This will allow us to give the object a realistic properties that make them look like they're actually constructed from specific materials such as plastic or glass etc. Let's take a moment then to consider the objects that we're building in 3D space. So take for example something like uh, a simple remote control. It's not enough to simply build this object in 3D, you actually have to define the characteristics of the material that it's made from. So in this case, the remote is made from some kind of hard plastic, and you'll notice that this gives um, a very specific soft effect, the way the light falls over the object. It's very even, and we don't get any very sharp highlights. You'll notice that the, the object also has a very slight bumpiness, or noise to the surface uh, just to do with the way that the plastic substance is produced. If you take a look at the buttons here, another example, you can see that the material is very different from the plastic that was used for the outer case. In this case, this looks like kind of more of a, a, a spongier, soft plastics being used. It looks finer. You can see the light reacts with it slightly differently. It looks softer still. It's also slightly translucent. You'll see that the, the light is almost almost able to get through this to a certain extent. Let's move on to a different object which is completely different. Uh, for example, a set of pool balls. Well, you'll notice here that these are incredibly shiny and what we're looking at are both specular highlights which are these little so, uh, very very um, sharp bright dots that appear on shiny surfaces. We refer to these as specular highlights and essentially these are made from light sources in your scene that interact with the object. So that's really important to note that the object's surface doesn't exist alone by itself. The material um, is designed to interact with light because at the end of the day the the light that's in your scene is what causes the, the material to look a certain way in combination with uh, the, the roughness or smoothness of that object. We're also looking at reflections here. You can see um, some windows perhaps or a scene being reflected in the object. So this material is incredibly different from that remote material that we saw in the previous example. So another example might be chalk. Well this is different again from both of the previous examples. You're seeing a very consistent um, diffuse lighting across this object the shadows are very soft, but also the highlights are incredibly soft. And this is because of all these microscopic pits, uh, these little valleys that are in, uh, in the surface, which cause the light to be dispersed all over the place and gives this very soft look. Now, in contrast, the pool balls are incredibly smooth. And because of that, the light rays bounce off um, in a given direction and they're very, very parallel compared to the chalk. So the light rays bounce off and they're almost parallel. Essentially the smoother the surface, the straighter and more parallel the light rays are likely to be when they bounce off. And the straighter and more parallel those light rays are when they bounce, the, the shinier the object will be. The remote control kind of sits in between. It's not as, um, as pitted and bumpy as the chalk uh, in fact, the bumps are larger, and that causes a mixture of um, parallel rays and also scattered rays. So we're looking at uh, kind of a diffuse but also slightly shiny effect. So it's really important to consider the surface material of the object that you're building. Most people underestimate this and think that the, the object modeling is the most important thing. And while that is important, it's um, it's equally if not more important to consider the material and how you're going to construct that using the, um, the options that are available to you in the 3D software you're using. So let's look at how we can do this in 3D Studio Max. Inside Max then let's go ahead and create a simple sphere as uh, a working example to get us started. Now what you'll notice is that this material that's on this object is kind of a default material that's created within Max. It's kind of an in-between between the pool ball and the chalk. It's kind of soft but it has a little bit of a highlight on there as well. Now 
so far all we've been doing is adding color to our objects using this guy here and all we're really doing is changing the diffuse color of the object so to actually get into this further and create the look of this object we need to start using the material editor so in 3d studio you'll find this guy up here in the top right hand corner and if you hover over it, it says material editor and this will load up the newest incarnation of this which is the slate material editor now this is like I say a newer addition to 3d studio and it's kind of node based it's a more visual system it allows you to see what's being connected to what and it gives you a better idea of you know where everything's at so you can uh, easily manage the material now in contrast if you go to modes and select compact material editor this is where you'll see the old school material editor that used to be used in 3ds max and you know some people still like to use this but it's a little trickier to kind of navigate your way around and if you haven't used Max before, I definitely recommend that you get started straight away in the newest uh, Slate Material Editor. Let's take a quick look at this Slate Material Editor then to get us familiarized with it. Now on the left hand side, by default, you'll have the Material and Map Browser. And this is essentially where you get started. You choose kind of a base to get started with your material and you can pick from a number of predefined standard materials within 3D Studio and predefined maps and also we can see the materials that are actually placed in our scene now in the middle here we've got view one which is essentially a work area now what we do is we place materials here as we work on them it's not uh, a definition of what is actually in the scene and contained on objects it's purely used for um, giving us a chance to, to connect things together, remove things, and it, it's just a work area. On the top right, we'll use the navigator to actually move around the work area because we're limited on view size. We typically want to zoom in on this. And navigator works kind of similar to the navigator in Photoshop. And then each material that we work on, uh, be it the actual shader or the map, the parameters or properties of that object will sit here in the parameter editor. Before we get started though, I would like to explain the difference between uh, a material and its shaders uh, compared to a map or texture that you can use in conjunction with your, the initial material. So let me quickly explain that. So here I have a sphere and this essentially has a standard material applied to it. Now the material is comprised purely of a shader at this point. Now a shader defines how the material reacts with the light in the scene. Now we're not going to be creating any lights in this particular video. What, what you should know though is that even though you haven't created any lights in your scene, 3D Studio and in fact most 3D packages put in default lights. So we've got, you know, we've got a, a key light here and what looks like a fill or a backlight down here. And this allows us to see the objects in our scene, especially when they're set to the realistic mode. Now the shader defines the color of the object, it defines um, the shininess of the object, and this is the specular highlight. And as I rotate around the object in 3D space, you'll notice that it's constantly interacting with that light in my scene. And as I move around, you'll see that the, uh, the backlight here is interacting with it. And it's the algorithms in that shader that are causing it to interact with the light. So the shader defines the properties of that surface, the color, the shininess, um, the transparency, for example. There are numerous different parameters. When you hear the term texture or map, as they're referred to in 3ds Max, what we're talking about are 2D images. And these could be, you know, as simple as a photograph as I've got in this case, which is just a, you know, a photograph of, of some laminate wood on a desk. Um, it's essentially just a 2D picture made up of pixels. And this can also be produced uh, as a what's known as a procedural texture, which might be similar to a noise filter in Photoshop, where you change sliders and parameters and they 
they emit different amounts of noise or blurriness for example if you're applying a blur filter that will be procedurally created through a bunch of equations inside the software in this case though this is just a static image which re represents a 2d texture so there's a difference between the shader and the texture and the good news is you can use both of them together to kind of achieve the optimum result and while we'll mostly be talking about shaders in this video textures um, we'll, we'll get into them a little bit uh, mostly procedural though such as adding noise or gradient maps all right back in 3d studio max then let's take a look at my scene i just have a default sphere set up with a standard color applied to it now before we actually get into creating materials we should talk about the way the viewport is designed uh, it's designed to give you the, the, a nice balance between a good looking scene and and good looking materials but also it's optimized for speed so that I can rotate and look at my scene um, without you know it chugging and lagging behind so what you're looking at in your viewport is really a cut down version of that material and as the materials get more complex and interesting then these will show up less and less and they'll just look more and more basic in your viewport so to actually get an idea of what this material looks like we have to start rendering out the scene and rendering is what we typically do at the end of a project when we finish the animation and we want to show it to someone. We render it to a series of frames and these can be put together into a movie, for example. They're essentially the final presentation version of your scene. So to do a quick render, I can simply click on the Render Production button, which is this little teapot in the top right hand corner. And if I click on that, it's going to give me the presentation view of my scene from the current camera and already you can see that the calculations on this um, ball are much more refined, much more accurate, it looks smoother and it looks nicer but I can tell that it also took a little bit longer to render out, you know, it took a fraction of a second but when you rotate this around in real time it's, it's rendering it at sort of, you know, 60, 100, maybe even 200 frames a second on a low res scene like this now by default we're using a type of rendering engine which is just built into 3D Studio Max and while this render is okay it's not the best out there now if you actually go to render preset we can see some templates that are kind of loaded into 3D Studio and by default we're using this 3DS Max scanline renderer and like I say it's good but it's not the best now 3DS also comes packaged with Mental Ray which is a standalone renderer and it's incredibly good at producing realistic scenes and it's fast and makes excellent use of ray tracing. So we're actually going to use Mental Ray to test our materials and I would suggest that you use Mental Ray No GI and GI just stands for Global Illumination which is a technique that we won't be needing for this, for this lesson at least. So once I've clicked on that to load in that preset, it says what categories do you want to load in? You can just leave them all selected and click load. And already things are starting to look a little bit different and you can't really see it completely because of my resolution, but at the bottom of my render view now we've got the presets for the mental ray renderer and you can see we've got image precision here, we've got a slider for that, glossy refl reflections precision, soft shadows, refractions, final gather, that's disabled, um, and we've also got options for reflections and refractions, and this is essentially just the accuracy of that render. You know, the more accurate it is, the better it's going to look, but the longer it's going to take to render out. So to do a test render, you just click on the render button, and see it's rendering, and already this is starting to look just a tiny bit better than what it had initially. And I'm going to push this off to the side and actually start creating a material for this now. It's a good idea to keep your render view handy and just keep checking this periodically as you create your material. So I could click on the material, the slate editor up here, or I could just tap the M key to bring up my material editor. And to start with I'm going to create one of the simplest forms of materials in 3DS, which is the standard material here. If I double click on this, what it does is it puts a standard material into my work view. Now, this doesn't belong to the scene. If I save this, this won't get saved in. Like I said, this is just 
a working prototype as it currently stands. Now, to begin with, I might create something um, like plastic for my material. So it, it's a good idea to start by renaming your materials so it, you don't just see material number 26 or material 370, etc. So just as you rename your objects, it's important to rename your materials also. The first thing I'll do then is just right click on this new material that I've created and click on rename and I'll just call this plastic mat, plastic material. Okay, first things first, how do we navigate this? Well, it's just like navigating your viewports. You can use the middle mouse button to pan it around, control and alt with the middle mouse button will zoom in and out. And as you start creating more complex materials, this starts to get a little muddled and complicated here. So what you typically end up having to do is use this navigator here to move around the viewport. It's just easier to do. If I double click on my material here, you'll notice that the parameters for the material show up in the parameter view on the right hand side here. You can see I've got these different options. What you're looking at in the view here is actually a node based view of the material and it allows you to make connections. You can see from all these different properties of this shader, I can connect maps or other um, features in to these parameters here. And I can connect these just by linking up the nodes. So it's a very visual system and it, it's a nice way to work. Well, right now my material does not sit on my object. So the easiest way to do this is to select the object you want to apply the material to and you can click on this little button up here assign material to selection. You click on that and you'll notice that it's changed color. It's changed to the default gray that all standard materials start with. Additionally you can also right click on the material and select assign material from there. So first things first we should do another test render to see what this looks like and you can see that the properties of this material have changed already that specular highlight isn't quite as strong the shine that appears on the sphere and so far so good so back to our material editor then let's start looking at some of these properties for the material so if I double click on this we'll look at the parameters on the right the first thing we should talk about are these shader types that we have here and by default 3ds max starts with a blin shader now remember I said that the shader on your material is how it interacts with light. We are using different equations or algorithms that have been written by the designers to produce that interaction with the light and give you a nice looking material. Over the years different people have written their own shaders and some have been more successful than others but one of the kind of standard material types that was created very early on was by Jim Blinn and he named it after himself and it's the blin shader and this will show up in multiple different packages that you use if you click on this though you'll also see a whole bunch of different shader types that you can use they're just different algorithms that have been written and these are the ones that really took off in software like Maya you might see a Lambert which is a simplified version of a blin and it just doesn't give you the ability to add specular highlights but in 3ds Max blin is about as simple as it gets Fong is another one, Strauss, again these are being named after the people that actually created the shader. So first things first, you choose a shader based on the type of material you want to create. If you want to create a soft material, perhaps with specular highlights, you choose a blin. A Fong shader is going to give you the ability to have slightly sharper highlights and I believe it renders a little bit faster as well. So you just through experience you choose the shader that is naturally suited to the type of material you're trying to produce. Now you'll notice some options here if I click on a wire then my object renders out with the tries of the object visible so you can see that it just puts it into a wireframe view. In fact I'm going to zoom in on this so I can see it a bit better. Uh, that's useful if you're trying to produce um, wireframe views for your turntables when you're trying to sell yourself as a modeler. And let's look at two-sided. Well, by default, all polys only have a single side. They have the front and the back. Uh, 
and when you render from the front you'll see the color of the object when you render from the back it's typically see-through now enabling this two-sided option just ensures that your object renders with color on both sides uh, another useful one is this uh, faceted option here if you click on that when you come to render out you'll see that the object is no longer smooth and that's because that smoothing is just a lighting trick based on the shader that's been applied to the material and by enabling that faceted option we're just saying disable that lighting trick and show me each poly one by one so that's useful if you're trying to do tests on your object or if you're going for a, a very specific look now we've got some basic parameters here which show up on most materials and these will change based on the shader type that you're using the first here is ambient and ambient refers like I said the material is is interacting with the light around it ambient refer, refers to ambient light or kind of light that's just softer and bouncing around the room it's soft light so the ambient color here um, refers to the kind of softish light that's going to be bouncing onto your object diffuse here is the actual color the diffuse surface of your object uh, the diffuse just meaning that it's the softer part of the object the specular highlight is that, that shine that we're going to create and you'll notice how the object just kind of disappears into a gray when the light disappears that's the diffuse property of the self shadowing on that object so right now my diffuse color is set to gray so my object is gray and in, by default in Max ambient and diffuse are tied together by this little option here so you change one and the other one changes they kind of work off each other so to change the color of my object I'm just going to click on diffuse use my color picker and perhaps I want my plastic ball to be kind of a, a blue click OK both of those have updated and in my 3D view my object has changed to blue And again keep on rendering keep on checking the progress uh, to check that you're getting what you expect to see specular refer refers to the color of the highlights caused by the lights in your scene now right now the specular highlight isn't very visible so there's no point in changing this at this time uh, we'll get to that in a minute self illumination just uh, mimics the idea that this object gives off light it doesn't really give off light in your scene it just uh, kind of pretends it does so if you increase this value here you'll notice that my shadows disappear if I put it right up to 100 and do a render the object looks a little bit more like a light bulb like it's giving off light if you change it to color you can just essentially use a color value instead of a numeric value to change that but by default I'm gonna leave this right down at zero opacity quite simply is how transparent or opaque that object is in your scene so as you change that objects that sit behind it are likely to show through in this case though it just makes you look darker because of the black background down to these specular highlights option then again this is what really makes the object look like it's shining what looks like it's it's got this glow let's put opacity back to a hundred and if I increase the specular level as I increase this you'll notice that my object starts to look more shiny so we're simulating that this object now has a smoother surface it's less pitted and that the light rays are reflecting off or bouncing off uh, parallel or more parallel now to increase the parallel effect of these light rays we increase the glossiness and that pulls that highlight so it's sharper and sharper and sharper so now it's starting to look like a really um, extremely shiny surface let's put this all the way up and this might be this you know it's starting to look like that pool ball that we saw in the earlier example you'll also notice that as I'm adjusting these values the graph on the right hand side is updating and this is showing me the fall off of that specular highlight so right now it's quite a large highlight but it's also got a soft fall off you can see how it's quite soft as it falls off away from the object and that adjusts it gives me kind of a nice 2d graphic but 
at the same time the render is still going to give you the best representation of what this looks like um, yeah, as the final version. So here's my render and already we can see how sharp those highlights are looking and uh, this is already looking a little bit sharper. For my plastic though that I'm trying to recreate here I really want this to be a little bit softer so I'm going to lower the specularity and lower the glossiness and now it's starting to look more like a plastic toy. There we go. It's still a little bright though. And what we're doing here is we're we're essentially doing the job of a shading expert uh, in the industry. And this is an entire job description. People whose jobs it is to recreate the realistic surfaces for films, video games, etc. And it's a very specialist art form. And this is starting to look a little bit nicer now. I like the way that's looking. Um, beyond that you've got these extended parameters that sit here and this really is the, a slightly more advanced look at the at the material and how its shader works. Uh, fall off defines how the transparency of the object changes from the inside to the outside. Super sampling, um, this is to overcome aliasing problems. When you render something out you're converting it into a set of pixels. And even on this right now, you can actually see that the edges of this ball look a little bit jagged. And if I were to zoom into this, I can do that just by holding down control, and a left click will zoom in, and a right click will zoom out. But in the most severe case, if I zoom in, you can see these jaggies that appear here. Super sampling allows you to utilize something called anti-aliasing, which is basically getting rid of that jagged, jagged aliasing effect. Um, what it does is it renders the image at a larger size and then just reduces the image size down at the last minute for presentation and that gives you a softer result. It's a technique that's often used in video games these days. Um, we also have this maps section and this is where you start applying 2D maps into the shader. Now that could be procedural or photographs etc. And this, that's all held, uh, dealt with under the maps section. And then mental ray, this is uh, a section which is essentially uh, specific to the mental ray renderer that we're using in the scene. Right now though you can get a heck of a lot done just by looking at the basic blin parameters. So to begin with I could say well I think that my my shiny plastic ball is looking okay. So I could call that one good. Now, if at any time I decide that I don't want that material on my object anymore, I've kind of got two things that I can do. I can either create a new material and apply it to that object, or I can remove all materials completely by going to my Utilities panel on the right. And I've actually got it showing here because I've already used it, but if you go to the More button, you want to select UVW Remove click OK. Oops, I'll do that again to bring it back. And you can just click materials and you can see it removed that material from the object and just reverted it back to the default. I want it on the object though so I'm just going to assign it back. Now like I said this is only temporary this view here. So I can actually select this and either hit the delete key on my keyboard or the red X here to clean out my view still exists in the scene though and it's still going to get saved into the file when I hit save. If I scroll down my material and map browser right at the bottom suddenly you'll start to see scene materials is populating with all of these defaults here and then in particular this plastic material that I created here. So this material is now belonging to the scene. If I want to get it back to work on it some more I just double click on it and it brings it back and I can adjust these parameters again to my liking. I'm finished with this one for now though so I can either push it off to the side or in this case I'm just going to remove it from my working area and create a new material. In fact what I think I'll do is just make a quick copy of this. Sphere 2, make a copy and move this off to the side because I want to create another object to test a new material on. 
Now in this case, I'm not going for the sort of duller plastic that I had initially. I'm going to try and go for that really shiny pool ball that I had before. So I'm going to create a new standard material and I'll rename it and I'll call this pool ball material. I'll bring out the parameters and I'll apply it to my object. So it's reverted back to the default. And I'm going to keep rendering now because I'm going to use this original object as a comparison uh, with the new object that I'm creating here. So I could use a blin again and I could let's give it a different diffuse color. Now maybe I'll go for a green this time. No, I'll go for a red. And maybe I'll pull down that value a little bit. Excellent. Specular highlight, I'm gonna leave that at white and I'll adjust that later to show you what that does. But I know that I'm going to need to increase this specular level because I know this pool ball is going to be very shiny. And I'll also increase the glossiness. And you can see in the preview here, you can actually get a good look at what it's creating. And if I double click that, it brings up a slightly larger version. So I can actually look at a nice rendered view of what I'm creating here without having to render my object. But it's a good idea to keep checking your render view because your objects are typically going to be more complex than a simple sphere. So I can double check it in my render view. Alright, it's coming together. I'll make it a little bit glossier. I increase that specular level a bit more. Okay, so we've got two very different looking objects here. This one's looking a lot a lot duller. It's still got a little bit of a sheen to it and this one's looking that much brighter. Um, what you'll notice though is that one of the key characteristics to very shiny surfaces are actually reflections and reflections are not going to be available by default on the standard material. So we'll discuss that later. For now though I think this will work as a start and what I might do just to show you the difference is create a copy of this guy and temporarily create another material and this one I'm gonna just call pool ball fong mat and the only reason I'm doing this is to show you that the different shader types uh, you can actually add on to this so if I wanted that pool ball to appear that much shinier, I might actually decide to use a Fong shader. So in this new material I've created, just double click it to bring out the properties. I'm going to change it from Blin to Fong. It's using a different set of algorithms now to uh, define this surface. I'll give it a color. Again, I'm going to pick kind of that red, bring down the value a bit and apply it to my new material. Make sure it's selected and apply. Okay, I can see these side by side here. This is kind of interesting. Let me increase the specular highlight and by default you're going to go, well, that looks exactly the same. But the truth is, these um, equations are slightly different and even in this render view you can see how that highlight appears different in that rear view and that's because the angle of the light and the way it hits that surface is 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 shown differently using the Fong shader from the Blin shader and also I can get my highlights to be that much sharper using a Fong and get that fall off to look that much more impressive I'll do a quick render to look at the difference in my render view and again the quality of your render settings are going to affect the way this render looks but already you can see a difference here between the Fong and the Blin. Alright, just double check, come down here, you'll notice that more materials are being added into my scene. So as I save this file, those will get saved into the scene. And at this point, because no maps are present, I can still just transfer this scene around by itself and these materials will be transferred with it. Let's quickly remove these from the scene though, or from my 
from my edit view I should say and let's talk about a different kind of material I'll double click standard again create a new material and this time I'm going to create uh, we'll, we'll just call it metal for the sake of simplicity so I'll rename this to metal mat I'm not gonna worry about tweaking this and getting it to look like you know really nice metal but this is a great chance to introduce what's known as an anisotropic shader so I'll come back into my 3D view and this time I zoom I'll create another one of these and you know best practice I should really be renaming these here as well so this is metal and I'll apply my shader to this new object I've created and let's see I'm going to change the shader type from blin to anisotropic and we've got extra parameters here and if we look at the basic parameters for anisotropic it's already starting to look a little bit different so let's actually talk about what this is and how it works so here's an image that's been rendered using an anisotropic shader and you can see that this is the bottom of a pan and it's got that brushed aluminium or brushed steel effect and you'll notice that the highlights kind of splay off in different directions they also take on different shapes based on this surface and that's what's so great about the anisotropic shader is that the highlights it produces can be bent and moved in different directions to look more complex than simple blin specular highlights and so the surface can look that much more interesting and you can create uh, a variety of materials and brushed metal is one of those so looking at our material again let's just do a quick render see what we've got okay looking pretty plain and boring and this in in all honesty if you set the specular value of any of these materials right down to zero you're saying this object has zero um, specular highlight zero shininess what you're actually creating is what's known as a Lambert shader and that's th one of the simplest forms of shaders you can create and it's useful for something like chalk which doesn't actually contain really a specular highlight in this case though I'm going to give it a different color so let's give this metal kind of a kind of a cool gray something like that and let's look at how this works so if I come into my specular highlight options you'll notice that I've got two graphs they move in two different directions that represent uh, both the fall off in the length and the width of the specular highlight so we've got a, a length and a width fall off so it can give us a, a different shape of highlight again this is this is not going to get displayed accurately now in your 3D view in your rough and ready viewport and the reason for that again is just to do with speed So if I come to my render view in fact I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on these guys render this out All right, it's harder to see right now a lot of that might be to do with the color I picked so let's pick something darker just to show and also increase the glossiness of this highlight and that specularity and render again alright already you can see that this highlight takes on a different shape than the standard blin highlight so again I can't see that in my real-time view but I can see it in my rendered view now as you adjust these parameters you can adjust not just how sharp that highlight is but also this anisotropy value here which adjusts essentially how one of these highlights can be thinner or thicker than the other and in doing that you see I'm thinning this out because of the shape of the surface though it's harder to see that highlight right now that second highlight but if I adjust orientation things start to get even more interesting you'll notice how it starts to take on a little bit of curvature here increase that a bit more there we go so I can orient this 
highlight according to my object and the light source that I'm using. Now, this is this kind of a fine art to really tweaking this to get it to look exactly as you want, but just play around with it for the time being and get a feel for the fact that the different shading properties in this algorithm are very different from the blend shader and also the fong shader, so it's going to give you very different results. And if you keep playing with them, you'll probably come up with something pretty interesting. I should also mention this diffuse level. That's just an additional an additional control that the shader has. And at 100, that diffuse level looks normal, which is that diffuse color. If I lower it down, it basically darkens that diffuse down. I keep lowering it down. And the diffuse color gets darker, and yet, so everything sort of looks shaded, and yet the specular highlight remains constant. As I mentioned earlier, you can change the color of that specular highlight, and this controls it independently of the diffuse color. Now this is kind of an extreme example of this. If I change it to yellow, my highlight changes to yellow. So that's a very specific look. You really wouldn't want to change it to, to such an extreme extent, but playing around with that is useful if you want your surface to have, you know, kind of a, a slightly off-white color to it. So in addition to these shaders that we've looked at previously, another shader type that we could use would be the Strauss shader. Uh, this is kind of a simplified, easier to use version uh, of a shader that it simplifies all of the specularity properties into this one glossiness parameter. And you also have this metalness option here, which essentially just uh, changes the highlight in such a way to make it look either more or less like a metal surface. Um, another one that you might be interested in is the, let's see, multi-layer shader. And really what this is doing is taking the anisotropic shader and it's putting each highlight on its own layer. So you have a lot more control over how these um, individual highlights are manipulated so you can kind of send them off in different directions and it gets very interesting so I definitely recommend you play around with that what I would like to show you though is some of the extended parameters so I'm gonna just put this back to a standard blin and I'm gonna call this material glass material just ever so quickly I'd like to show you a couple of those parameters so let me just make a quick clone of this and apply that material to that and the reason I'm doing this is because I, I want to show you some of these extended parameters that we see here so let's just make this glass fairly shiny and in addition I'm going to lower the opacity to about 50%. See what that gives us. Fairly plain on just a simple black background, but you'll get the idea. If I click on extended parameters, the one I want to show you is this fall off value. And what this actually does is it's adjusting the transparency across the surface of the object. And it leaves the specular highlight pretty much constant. So the in value is essentially going to increase the transparency as you move from the outside to the inside of the object. So the amount is just from 0 to 100 and you can think of it as a percentage. So 100% means the inner portion of this object is going to be entirely transparent. You can check that with a render. and You can see it's actually done that. It's made that inner portion transparent and it kind of gives this interesting effect uh, as if as if it were made of glass and doing the out value is going to do the complete opposite and you can see it gets more transparent as we move to the edges of this object as we look at it so obviously you'd want to tweak these values and adjust that to get it to looking sort of exactly as you like it the the filter types we have here we've got subtractive and additive, those are essentially like uh, Photoshop layer filters. So if I were to rotate my view around so that I could see the object that's immediately behind it, 
and let's change the filter type to subtractive or the blend mode I should say you can see that's where it gives us and if I change it to additive and re-render you can see it's that much brighter because it's it's essentially adjusting the way the pixels between the foreground object and the background object are interacting with each other so it's essentially just a blending mode if I were to actually play around with this filter option here on transparency right now by default it's just set to a standard gray but if I were to change it say to a have a bright green and re-render this you'll see that on the side of the shape as we decrease the transparency make it more opaque you're getting that green filter in there so some interesting effects you might get that kind of on stained glass or something like that so that would be the standard set of shaders that we have available to us uh, in addition there are some other uh, shaders that we can work with um, for example we could use the ray trace material and this is a little different from the standard material in that it actually allows the renderer to utilize its ray tracing capabilities now what that means in plain English is that you can do cool things like reflections and refractions so for example I've created a standard ray trace material here and I'm gonna leave it at the default fong and I think what I might do is just add in one more sphere into my scene so I'll just clone this guy do this and zoom in and I'll apply this new material and let's see assign material let's give it a name of um, reflect reflective glass mat and let's come down here and let's make it a little bit shinier so we'll increase the specular level make it a little glossier as usual we're going to double check this in a render okay that's looking pretty standard right now what I can do is actually come down to this reflect parameter here and this is really what makes use of ray tracing in uh, at least ray traced reflections in mental ray now it's checked which means it will do reflections but right now we have a black color assigned to this and essentially what this means is black is zero reflections white is 100 percent reflected like a mirror so if I change this from black to pure white and then did another render of this same scene suddenly everything disappears because my scene is completely black so it's reflecting black but you can see here this sphere to the left is being reflected perfectly in the side of this other sphere here so reflections are working so let's make it a little bit more dynamic and let's consider putting this guy here switching the order of these and perhaps I'll lower down reflectivity a little bit because that's a little too much so I might take that right down sort of a very dark gray and render this scene out again okay now what you can see in fact let me zoom in a little bit because that's a little difficult and bring these a little closer there we go now you can see that we've got this nice you know light not mirror like reflections but just this ability to give a little bit of reflection from objects in our scene so right now this looks like a kind of a highly a highly polished plastic so if I were to for example increase the glossiness a little more and bring up the specular level again a little more now it's starting to look more like a shiny pool ball now in addition to that ray traced shader that we could use we could also make use of this ink and paint shader and this would really be typically referred to as a cell shader now what this does is it would give a very stylized look to your object so for example let's quickly clone this guy out again 
and I'm going to rotate it so I can see down the stack of objects again. And lastly, apply that. If we look at this, we can see that we've essentially got, you know, the, the ability to put in a highlight, but by default we've just got this kind of lit area and the default color. Um, if we look at a render of this, you'll easily see how this is stylized. And what we get is this kind of cell shaded effect. So it looks like uh, 3D, which has been converted into a 2D effect, it gives you this nice block of color, very clean sh uh, shading here and this kind of ink outline and adjusting these parameters will allow you to tweak that effect so the ink, the ink quality, the width, etc. So you can have a lot of fun with those ones. Uh, additionally we have a number of special materials that belong to for example this mental ray library and again these are materials that have been designed and heavily customized towards a specific type of surface. Hardwoods, uh, let's see, concrete, um, we've even got, let's see, car paint, etc. So these are more specialist materials and will give you kind of uh, the results you're after faster, but to begin with I would definitely recommend that you start with standard materials just to get a, a good grip on using specularity, diffuse color, etc. And finally, before I finish the video, I would like to talk a little bit about using maps in your scenes. Now, we talked earlier on about the difference between a material and a map or texture. And essentially, what we can do is I can just give you a little demonstration and show you how you can start linking in other nodes using 2D maps into your existing materials. So I'll clone this guy out again as a test subject and what I think I'll do is I think I'll apply a standard fong to this or a standard blin I think would work well so I'll do a standard blin and again I'm gonna go for that plastic kind of look so I'll change my diffuse to perhaps something like a, a darkish blue that'll allow my highlights to show up nicely apply that to my material and zoom in on that and see what we get. Okay, good. So now I need some more specularity on there to give me that shiny plastic look. It's a little too much. Okay, so we've got that plasticky look. The ability to add in maps allows you to customize the look of certain things on your object based on where you plug the map. For example, let's scroll down here to the maps section and in the next video I'll be talking more about bitmaps specifically so we'll start by talking about procedural maps in this video and in particular I'm going to add a noise. So I'll double click that to add noise to my work area and I'll widen this up so we can see a bit better now, right now, nothing is connected here, so this noise will have no effect whatsoever. If, though, I grab this and plug it in to my diffuse color, what I'm saying is use this noise map as the color instead of the blue that I currently have plugged in. And you can verify that that map is connected not just through this node view, but by the fact that this little M has appeared here under map 1. In fact, if you click on that, you can actually get the parameters for map 1 which is the same as double clicking on map 1 here. Now this is a 2D map which is being procedurally generated and it's similar to adding a noise filter in Photoshop. You can make lots of noise, less noise, big noise, small noise, etc. So to start with, let's see what chaos this has created. All right, You think, well that's done absolutely nothing, but the truth is it's done something. What's actually happening here is that the size value on my noise parameters is way too big. So if I scale this right down, let's start with 6. You can see my map is updated here. Re-render this. Now we can start to see a bit of variation through this noise. So if I take the scale down even more, let's do 0.9 and re-render this.
now you can start to see the noise map and what's happening is it's wrapping this 2D map around this 3D surface and using that as the uh, surface color instead of the default diffuse color that we applied. Now that's still a little too big so I'm going to go right down to say 0.1 and re-render. Alright, now we're starting to see some very very fine noise on this. In fact it's quite tricky to see so I'm going to zoom in even more and re-render this again. There we go. So you can see that noise. So this is how we actually add texture to the surface of the material, and in this case by using a procedural texture. However, we don't have to explicitly use this on the color or diffuse channel of our map. For example, before earlier on we saw that remote control had kind of a bumpy surface texture to it, and a lot of that was to do with how the, the surface uh, split up the specular highlight because of the large bumps that were on the surface. So why don't I take this diffuse, uh, this noise that I've mapped into the diffuse channel, pick it up, and instead plug it into the specular level. So I'm saying, give me my specular highlight, but make it noisy. If I re-render this now, you see we get the original blue but now the specular highlight's been broken up by that noise map. So now we're starting to get kind of a bumpy, uh, a bumpy plastic effect through that specular highlight. Another way to do this would be a little more effective, and that would be to actually make use of the bump node here in our material. And that is actually a lighting trick. And what it does is it fools the eye by simulating surface bump. So while right now this looks rather flat, if I were to plug this into the bump node instead and re-render, suddenly that noise is starting to look a lot more 3D. It's looking a lot more effective. In fact, maybe I'll scale up that noise a little bit. Maybe I'll change that to 0.3. Very small values here. Okay, that's too big. But you can see how that, that bump map is an illusion, it's a lighting trick. We're not really adding this detail to the surface, it's just happening at render time. So maybe a value of 0.15 might be a, sort of a happy middle ground. And you get this really cool kind of plastic looking effect. So that's how we can start using maps to affect these parameters that belong to our shader that make up part of this material. So overall, that's kind of a starting video on how to get started with materials in 3D Studio and how to adjust the shading parameters to give you different effects. And lastly, how we can start to add in 2D textures to influence these 3D shaders. And the next video, we'll talk a lot more about maps, UV mapping, etc. So experiment with these different types of materials and see what you can come up with.